Hi, Philip Riley. I'm going to be reviewing Super Mario Bros. for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Super Mario Bros. is one of the most well-known video games of all time. Perhaps the most well-known video game of all time. Featuring the most well-known video game character of all time. The game is credited, along with the Nintendo Entertainment System, for bringing back the video game industry in the United States from ruin. Over 40 million copies of the game have been sold, making it one of the best-selling games of all time, without any game even coming close to it for over 20 years. Released in late 1985, Super Mario Bros. is the fourth game to star Mario, starting with Donkey Kong in 1981, then as the non-playable antagonist in Donkey Kong Jr. in 1982, and then in the original Mario Bros. in 1983. Super Mario Bros. was created by Shigeru Miyamoto, who alongside with Takashi Tezuka designed the game. The game went through various stages of development, from character changes to Mario even firing a gun as a weapon. Ultimately, they settled upon using the character Mario from the successful Mario Bros. game and making it a side-scrolling platformer. In fact, Super Mario Bros. was one of the first side-scrolling platform games. However, it was not the first. Jump Bug from 1981 holds that honor and has vertical as well as horizontal scrolling. Super Mario Bros. holds the distinction of being the first side-scrolling platformer with a human-like character. And I'm not counting BC's Quest for Retires from 1983 because that's more of a vehicular scrolling game like Moon Patrol that happens to have a vehicle in the form of a human riding on a wheel. Pitfall 2 Lost Caverns from 1984, which I covered in my previous review, had a running man character as well as vertical scrolling in a platform game, but it is still not a side scroller because it was limited to scrolling up and down. About a month before Super Mario Bros., the UK company Gremlin released a relatively unknown game, Thing on a Spring, a side scrolling platformer featuring a creature on a spring hopping around. Regardless, Super Mario Bros. set the standard for all future platform video games to come for its revolutionary gameplay and visuals. As a young child, I didn't have Super Mario Bros. in the NES. The only thing I could play with at the house was my brother's Atari 500 and a tiny Pong clone game system called a Video Sport by TCR. Those games and systems got me by, but I knew greater gaming experiences were out there to be had. I remember going over to a friend's house a few doors down to play Super Mario Bros. as well as playing at other places. As with most children at the time, I asked my parents to get me Nintendo for Christmas. I remember one funny mix-up when my mom was trying to get one for me. For some reason, she accidentally obtained a Nintendo storage cart instead of the console. I was confused and disappointed. The storage cart was sent back and I finally got my very own Nintendo Entertainment System just in time for Christmas. That was the greatest Christmas present of my childhood. I felt like that kid from A Christmas Story getting his Red Rider. Or that kid who got his Nintendo 64 before Christmas. Nintendo 64! Yeah, that kid. Um, I got the Nintendo Action Set with the Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt cart, two controllers, and an orange zapper light gun. It was time to get down and play Super Mario Brothers. I won't mention all the ports and versions of the game, as that would be an extensive review on its own, but I'll mention most of them. Super Mario Bros. was released on a standalone card, as well as the first version I had on a combo card featuring Duck Hunt, and a card featuring three games, Super Mario Bros. Duck Hunt and World Class Track Meet. Super Mario Bros. also came on arcades as Versus Super Mario Bros., which I was fortunate enough to play back in the day at the Circus Circus Casino in Las Vegas. This version features slightly harder levels designed to eat players' quarters. I was even able to find the arcade cabinet in the present day and an arcade at the Santa Monica Pier in California. Super Mario Bros. was also released on a compilation card, Super Mario All Stars, in 1993 for the Super Nintendo, along with Super Mario Bros. 2 Japan, Super Mario Bros. 2 USA, and Super Mario Bros. 3 featuring updated graphics and slightly altered gameplay physics. This compilation was also called Super Mario Collection in Japan for the Super Famicom. A compilation including Super Mario World in 1994 was also released. In 1999, it was also released as Super Mario Bros. Deluxe for the Game Boy Color. 
featuring a map, new simultaneous multiplayer gameplay, and other enhanced game modes, slightly enhanced visuals, and the Japanese version of Super Mario Bros. 2. Super Mario Bros. was also released in the Game Boy Advance in 2003 as the exact same port of the original NES game. Super Mario Bros. All-Stars for the Super Nintendo, which includes Super Mario Bros., was ported to the Nintendo Wii in 2010 as the exact same game as part of the limited edition 25th anniversary box set. Let's now get into the original game that inspired imitation and influenced an entire genre. Let's now power up Super Mario Brothers! The game boots up with a start screen showing the title of the game and the star of the game, Mario. You are presented with an option of selecting a one player game or a two player game. If you press select and then start on the controller, the second player will get to play as Luigi after the first player controlling Mario loses a life, with each player alternating after each other. If no buttons are pressed, the game automatically starts playing on its own as a quick little demonstration of the game. Simply press start and the game begins. Mario starts off in a not so super form on the lower left side of the screen of the game. Move him along, squash that little creature called a Goomba, not to be confused with a Goomba, a man of Italian descent. That would be Mario. I better watch out. Mario might ask me if I think he's a funny guy, if I amuse him. Maybe he's more of a fun guy, but I'll get into that next. After you squash the Goomba, hit some question mark blocks. One common misconception is that Mario hits bricks with his head. No, 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 no. If you look closely, Mario is clearly hitting them with his fist. Imagine all the brain damage he would have endured. He would be shouting off phrases like, oh yeah, Mario time. Oh, wait. Uh, most of these question mark blocks will be just be coins, but hit the right one to retrieve the first power-up, a magic mushroom, which was inspired by the Amanita muscaria mushroom, a toxic mushroom that has several side effects including micropecia, a visual sensation where all objects appear small, making the person feel large in comparison. Do not try eating it though, as it could be fatal. Kinda makes you wonder what the game designers were thinking when they were designing the game to be played primarily by children at the time. Kinda the opposite of Popeye getting children to eat spinach to be healthy and gain muscles. But Popeye also sends a load of mixed messages to children. Maybe that's not the greatest example. Well, once you get your power up and increase in size, you're able to take a hit by your baddie before you lose a life. Just like the brick blocks, most of the pipes won't do anything. But then you'll find the right one that leads to a hidden underground room. This particular pipe allows Mario to skip most of the level. These rooms also serve as a great place where you can collect coins. Collect 100 coins and earn another life. Another way to earn life is by finding the green one-up mushroom. Sometimes these are containing invisible blocks. Not all invisible blocks contain one-up mushrooms though. Sometimes they're a means of reaching hard to get places. If you're a big Mario, once you hit a question block that contains a power-up, a fire flower will appear. Grab the fire flower and you'll become Fire Mario. The first level serves as a great tutorial on how to play the game, introducing elements of the game in a simple way, conveying most of the mechanics of the game. Speaking of simplicity, one thing I didn't really give a lot of thought about was that the bushes and the clouds are the same sprites, just palette swapped, designing a way to work around the system's limitations of the time. If the player dies anywhere from the second pit onward, the game will start Mario off around the second pit, mark an invisible checkpoint. Some of the levels though lack these checkpoints. You'll get to an area where there are many question mark blocks and bricks to break. Some will have multiple coins. One plane block even holds a Starman power-up. This power-up serves as temporary invisibility for Mario. You can use it to clear out all of the enemies and reach near the end of the level until your invisibility runs out. Jump on the flagpole, preferably on the highest point for the most points, and you have finished the level. You will get a delightful tune, little melody to signify your accomplishment. If you time it just right, with the timer ending with a 1, 3, or 6, you will get the corresponding amount of fireworks, 1, 3, or 6, giving you 500 points each. One neat trick to pull off is to hit the brick containing the star man without touching the star man. Well, keep following the star, up until the star hits a point where it comes back. Catch it, then hit the bricks to coin a phrase. 
This is where running becomes necessary. Hold down the B button to run. The same button you use to fire as Fire Mario. Go as fast as you can to reach the flagpole. If you're fast enough, you'll glitch the game into replaying the normal overworld theme instead of the level ending tune. Once you beat the first level, a cutscene will play showing Mario entering a pipe to go underground. That's where level 2 begins. There's a significant amount of secrets and hidden things to discover in this level. The first thing you discover is that you can break the bricks on the ceiling and run through most of the level as you transverse across the status bar area. If you decide to stay below, you'll be able to gather more items, coins, a wet mushroom hidden in a block, and go into a pipe guarded by a piranha plant to collect even more coins. Once you pass the moving platforms, you'll have a few options, although you're presented with seemingly one as the pipe to your right leading to World 1-3. Remember being able to walk above where the status bar was? Well, jump off a platform and keep going to your right. Below are war pipes to lead to Worlds 2, 3, and 4. Now, something that most people won't be able to figure out on their own, there's a trick many people have passed on from word of mouth back in the day, although it's most likely from a kid who read about the trick of Mission 3 and the Nintendo Power. Well, down below where the pipe is leading to level 1 3, break some of the bricks, but leave the brick closest to the wall there. Jump into it in a crouched position carefully without breaking it. It may take a few attempts as it has to be done just right, and you'll pass through the wall to the other side where the war pipes are. But the game doesn't know that you reached that area and hasn't changed the war pipes to war pipes leading to worlds 2, 3, and 4. Instead, you will enter NEGATIVE WORLD! What is this craziness? I'll skip all the technical aspects of how this happens, so basically the game is loading level 36-1. But the hive number doesn't even register on the screen, so it displays as dash 1. But the problem with this is that world 36 doesn't even exist. So instead, you get a never-ending level 7-3 It keeps on looping. That's kind of a letdown after all the effort and shock wears down, but it's still cool regardless. I remember when I first got to my brothers, my friend Rick and my brother were able to get to the negative world. I was amazed by the whole new world they uncovered. I begged them to show me how to get there. Yes, my longtime friend Rick has done video game reviews with me, also known as Max Stolen on his channel. Well, Rick messed with me by telling me that I could get to negative world by jumping into the second pit in the first level. Being the gullible kid that I was, I took him at his word and jumped to my death in hopes of reaching it. Good one. I was eventually able to pull off the trick on my own. If you enter the pipe on the right, you will enter negative world. But the middle pipe takes you to 5 1. There are 32 levels in the game, with many types of levels in the game the overworld planes levels, underground levels, platform based levels, castle levels. Water levels, bridge levels, night levels. Even a black and white level. Another area is the cloud area, which isn't its own level, but is a hidden bonus subsection in some levels. In level 3-1 near the end of the level, there is a trick you can perform. 
As the Koopa Troopas walk down the staircase, jump on the last one as he nears the edge of the step. If he did it just right, it will ricochet off the step and come back to Mario, causing Mario to keep on jumping on the shell and earn points, eventually earning you free men. Just be sure not to get more than 128 lives, or your lives will reset. It's hard to tell how many lives you have based on reading your lives needed though. As once you get more than 9 lives, weird symbols like crowns will be displayed instead. If you get a game over at the title screen, hold A and press start to continue. Mario will start off in the first level in whatever world you left off in. In level 4-2, another cool trick to skip a small section of the level and get up to the status bar area is to align the left side of the screen just right to have partial breaks on the screen, but enough to be able to get stuck in between the left side of the screen and the bricks. If you've done it right, Mario will be able to jump all the way to the top. Here is another hidden item. Hit some hidden blocks here and hit the brick on the left. A vine will pop up and take you to a section of the level that normally would be a cloud area. But when you reach the end, it's a warp area to worlds 6, 7, and 8. If you skip this warp area, you can continue on to level 4-3. If you make your way above the brick ceiling, you'll find a warp pipe to world 5. Going back to the warp pipes to world 6, 7, and 8, world 8 pipe will lead you to the final levels of the game. Here you'll encounter the buzzy beetle more prominently. I've gone over some of the enemies, but I'll go over all of them, because why not? I'm doing them all! We have Goombas, little Mushroom Kingdom traders. Green Koopa Troopas, these guys wander a little aimlessly, sometimes to their doom. Red Koopa Troopas, the red ones are a little more aggressive and turn around when they approach the ledge. There are Green Koopa Paratroopas, these are the winged flying variety. The red Koopa Paratroopas are similar to the green ones but with a different flying pattern. The Hammer Brothers will throw hammers at Mario while jumping to different platforms. So, if the Mario Brothers are Mario and Luigi, is Hammer the name of at least one of the Hammer Brothers? Please Hammer, don't hurt him. Here comes the Hammer. Oh, 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 oh. If you wait too long, at 110 seconds of waiting around, the Hammer Brothers will finally get fed up and come after Mario. Then there's Lakitu, a turtle who lives in a cloud throwing deadly eggs that turn into spinings. These guys are not to be jumped on, hence the name Spiny. Coming out of some of the pipes are piranha plants, vicious carnivorous plants that come out to hurt Mario. They'll hide away though if Mario's directly on top of the pipe. Willow bills will either come out of their cannons or at certain levels come out of the side of the screen coming from seemingly nowhere. As a kid, that always perplexed me. I needed an answer. Where are they coming from? No one will ever know. Podobos, also known as lava bubbles, come out of their fiery pits to kill Mario. Just avoid them altogether. I don't really consider them much as bad guys, but more as environmental hazards like fire bars and the water current that sucks you down in the water levels. The Buzzy Beetle is one of the strongest enemies. He's unaffected by Mario's fireballs, but he can still be defeated by knocking him off a ledge, having another enemy sent into him, or having both enemies being sent into each other, double knockout. Cheep Cheeps are flying fish that can be pretty deadly. These guys and the Hammer Brothers are enemies that can really wreck my nerves. Cheep Cheeps can also be found underwater. Here they act less like fish from the Flying Piranha movies and more like actual fish. The real enemy to avoid here is the blooper. He's 
included that follows Mario around. The easy way to avoid getting hit by one of them is by simply staying on the floor level. You slipped up, blooper. Better add that to your blooper reel. Got him! Hook, line, and sinker. The boss you'll meet at the end of each castle is Bowser, King Koopa. Once you defeat each one, you'll find out that they were deceptions. Except for the last Bowser in level 8-4. Bowser turns into a Goomba in world 1, a Koopa Troopa in world 2, a Buzzy Beetle in world 3, a Spiny in world 4, a Lakitu in world 5, a Blooper in world 6, and a Hammer Brother in world 7. After defeating Bowser in castles 1-7, through seven, You'll be greeted by a mushroom retainer called Toad. He doesn't really look like a Toad, not at all. But his name is most likely short for Toadstool, which is also the princess's name, Princess Toadstool. Just another name for Mushroom. Mine blown. So you go up to Toad, and he will tell you, Thank you, Mario, but our princess is in another castle. When I was a kid, this pissed me off. I felt like I was duped. Imagine if you were trying to save Rapunzel from the castle, but once you get to her, you find out that she's really a dude. Yeah. Don't play with Mario's emotions like that. Mario doesn't even get anything for his trouble. Not surprising that Mario made Toad get off his butt and help out in Mario's next dreamy adventure. Now, on to level 8-4. Even from the first spot you start off at, you get the feeling that it's not going to be quite a walk in the park. Well, maybe a walk in the park in a sketchy park at night in the big city. This is where the game will test you to see if your jumping skills are honed in. So, make your jumps and leaps and run through the level. Here's where it can get a little tricky for first time players. The level will keep on looping itself over and over if you don't quite figure out the right path to take. Well, to get to the end you have to figure out the correct paths. So, this would be the third maze level in the game, as the castles in level 4, 4, and 7, 4 are also maze levels. Through trial and error, you will reach the last section of the level. This can be a little difficult for small Mario, but it's not uncommon to be small Mario since there are no power-ups to level 8-4. Defeat or get past the Hammer Brother, and you will encounter a hammer-wielding Bowser. Defeat him to finally reach the end. The princess thanks Mario and tells him that his quest is over but then tells him there's a second quest? What is this, ghosts and goblins? Well, this is the end of the game, but for any completionists out there, it ain't over till it's over. We're pressing B. The second quest is essentially the same game, but on hard mode. All the Goombas become buzzy beetles, all enemies on the ground walk faster, all long moving platforms are shortened, and many of the levels are made more difficult. Once you beat the second quest though, you are given the same exact ending. There is no third quest. You beat the game. As for difficulty, Nintendo gamers spawn the term Nintendo Hard, as many games were made difficult to keep gamers playing them. Super Mario Bros. wasn't exactly one of those Nintendo Hard games, but still posed a challenge to newcomers, as well as a challenge to experienced players playing through the entire game without warping. The game had a perfect learning curve, where the game gradually became more difficult as you got further into the game, but not unfairly difficult. For most players, World 1 is a breeze, but later worlds like 6, 7, and 8 can be on the challenging side. Level 8-1 will require you to hold the run button because it's a longer level where you could run out of time if you're not quick enough. Deaths may occur, but not because of the game's fault. The game physics are accurate, even too generous on occasion when Mario should have been hit, but the game hit detection let you get by. The music of the game is composed by Koji Kondo, the legendary composer who went on to compose for games like The Legend of Zelda, Star Fox, and almost every Mario game to come after.
There are five main musical scores in the game. The overworld theme. The underworld theme. Underwater theme. The castle theme. Starman theme, and various fanfares and jingles throughout the game. The overall theme, also known as the ground theme, is perhaps the most well-known theme in gaming history, with a multitude of remixes and renditions made from it. Super Mario Bros. is a game that has sparked the imagination of children and adults everywhere. Without it, I don't know what video game it would be. Sure, video games existed back then, and would continue to exist, but Super Mario Bros. and its sequels influenced almost the entire industry of the time, and continue to do so. Super Mario Bros. even inspired the formation of its software when John Carmack was working on scrolling technology for the PC and along with Tom Hall created a demo PC port of Super Mario Bros. 3 initially titled Dangerous Dave and Copyright Infringement to present to Nintendo. Nintendo declined, but it went on to create Wolfenstein 3D and Doom. Another example is Sonic the Hedgehog, which was created as a direct competition to Nintendo from Sega. Now Sonic can be found in various Mario games. Super Mario Bros. was the driving force of video game innovation in the mid 80s, and even to this day I can pick it up and play it because it's still an fantastic game to play even now. It's timeless. Thank you, Shigeru Miyamoto, for giving me and players like me Super Mario Bros. Thank you. If you like this video, please give it a like, comment below, and subscribe to my channel. this video hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon please consider supporting on patreon